The purpose of Free Thought Forum is to be vigilant to the encroachment of religion into government and to educate the general public as to what a free thinker is. My thoughts give me power. No scholar can map them. No hunter can trace. Hello, welcome to Free Thought Forum. I'm Katherine Farringer, the producer of this show and your host for this program. Today we're going to talk about population. Do we have a population explosion or don't we? Do we have a real problem with the earth and its resources or don't we? I have two guests today who are going to help me examine this, this uh, subject. Uh, fortunately, I have a, uh, uh, an expert in third world countries and that will be nice because I feel that since no man is an island, the third world countries are going to affect us. So I have as Patty McAllister is my first guest. And my second guest is uh, uh, the assistant uh, professor of geography at UTSA, Jeffrey Rowett. I Pleased got that right. Here. I missed the B. I forgot to put your initial in there. Is that all right? And Taddy, I'll approach you first because I want to know how you got involved with this and how you let me rope you into this. Would you explain a little bit about your interest in population? I uh, am a local businesswoman, but I was trained in history. And I do a lot of fundraising uh, for education and the arts. And it's been my fundraising for literacy that has changed a lifelong interest in population problems into a burning concern. And the way that you and I, I think, first became acquainted was because the, the fundamental right and the Catholic Church have taken one element of population control, which is abortion, out of the private realm and onto the political stage, the, uh, the, there is an, another problem involved in population control, and that is, in this country at least, separation of church and state, which is one of your uh, abiding interests. So I'm, I'm here to talk about both population control and the uh, other profound concern that goes along with it, which is separation of church and state. Wonderful. Now, uh, how are we going to tie this together here on this third world? I want to know a little bit about third world countries, too, and when we started calling third worlds third worlds. I was absent that day at school or something. When, when did this become the uh, term we use for the countries? Well, there are term? many terms that are used by social scientists and others to categorize different countries. Third world are, are one of those terms. Developing countries or underdeveloped countries are another of those terms. And uh, they've been pretty well established in the lexicon of uh, newspaper articles and television shows such as this. Well, we, when we were talking the other day, and this is something Taddy and I think are kind of on a similar plane as far as uh, my interest in this subject began in the 1950s. I got hold of a book by William Vogt called People, which was the most astonishing book I had ever read in my life. Uh, it, what It started off with a man writing the... Uh, uh, the Eiffel Tower, the, whoever supervises it or whatever, saying, I would like to make uh, an appointment to take my daughter to see the Eiffel Tower on the 6th of June, and it was like five years in the future, and I, it, really, it really got my attention right quick. And then I started looking around, and I could see, like, Taddy is involved with the literacy thing, and it just seems that suddenly it's just people, people, people everywhere. And I'm sure you're not uh, uh, unconconcerned about this country as well, or do you have, I know you told me that it's, it's a lot more complicated than just the matter of uh, birth control and abortion, right? Well, there's certainly uh, a population explosion taking place on this planet. Uh, in 1975, the population of the Earth was 4 billion. The year 2010 will bring us to 8 billion, a doubling in 35 years. Uh, our par my parents were born into a world of a population of about two billion. If I live long enough, I can possibly live and see a planet of 10 or even more billion people. So it is the consequences of that population explosion, not the fact of it that are being debated. Uh, 
some people uh, see the negative aspects to that population explosion. Other people see positive aspects. What do you see? <laughs> well, I can lay out the positive and negative aspects. Do it. Uh, generally, positive aspects can be seen in uh, a quickening uh, of the economy, an economic uh, boom period. As we had uh, the baby boom follow the, uh, in the post-World War II era, that also uh, spurred consumer demand. And so there is, uh, there is ex experience tells us that uh, in certain cases, uh, population growth does uh, increase economic development. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the negative uh, argument can be summed up as Neo-Malthusian. Uh, we're using resources at uh, uh, incredible rates. We're going, we may use up the Earth's resources. We certainly uh, have established uh, a hegemony over all. Uh, we, can, we can conceivably establish a hegemony over all ecosystems. And the environmental consequences of this population explosion are uh, extreme, can be extreme. So there are these two points of view. Obviously, there are point counterpoint to each one. Well, I think that it's much more important for us to save the earth than to have an economy which grows infinitely. Well, I, don't I have always wondered why it, growth in the economy is something to which we aspire. Now, obviously, the economy's got to grow in order to absorb all the people who are being born. Mm -hmm. But if you reached zero population growth and the economy plateaued out, let's say, right where it is today, what would be wrong with that? I'll get our expert to answer to that. I, now, I realize you're not an economist, I'm, but yes, you're bound but to have some training. I, I, just want, I just want to point out that, that population gr growth is not good for all economies. Uh, third world countries are pr particularly susceptible to uh, to uh, trouble in their economy with an acute population problem. For instance... Mainly because they can't feed themselves. Uh, it, their economies cannot double at the rates in which their populations are doubling. For instance, uh, third world countries can double uh, in population on the average every 33 years, but uh, some countries double at... Uh, about 20 to 25 years. Uh, and their cities, some of their largest cities, are doubling at the rates of between 10 and 15 years. When you have that incredible doubling time, this is if you, let's say you're doubling at the rate of every 20 years, you have to double not only the amount of food that you might grow or import, but you have to double the number of homes, hospitals, schools, the infrastructure the and the distribution infrastructure system. Of the whole economy. And uh, most economists see popu the population growth in third world countries as being detrimental and not positive uh, to third world economies. Well, let's talk about what happens to us in industrial countries when the population growth uh, gets out of hand. Let's say that this country has another 100 million people in it uh, in the next 50 years. Well, that probably won't happen. How many will it have in the next 50 years? <laughs> I knew there'd be a question like that. <laughs> You're supposed to know, right? Now, I read something about it somewhere, if only I could find it. Um, what the, um... Well, well but uh, we're, looking at, we're looking at the, the destruction of the northern forest by acid rain, which is caused by industry, which is the basis of the economy that has to grow when you have more people mm -hmm. to support. It's... We're looking at the destruction of the rainforest in Brazil because everyone is burning up the rainforest so that they can raise cattle to feed us hamburgers. Mm -hmm. We are looking at the destruction of our coasts because we have so much garbage, because we have so many people that we have so much garbage that we have no place on earth to put it, so we're putting it in the oceans. So we're wrecking our oceans. So I, I cannot imagine why having yet a larger population is going to be good for this country. Well, I, I quite agree with that. I can't see how it can either. And uh, I have been reading uh, some Stephen Mumford lately. He's uh, with a uh, population uh, a study in, um, in North Carolina. 
having to do with national security. And he feels that the church is causing us a great deal of trouble. Now, before I get into this church thing, which you touched on in, in this wonderful letter that you wrote, um, I want to clarify the fact that when you're talking about a church in the hierarchy, we're not talking about people who are Catholics. We are talking about the structure of the church. Uh, and I think, I think it has caused a great deal of trouble. Now, I was talking to Jeffrey the other day, and, and he said something about that. Were, didn't you say that religion had been a, a good influence in some way on... Well, I think, or, I think basically, I believe that the uh, Roman Catholic Church worldwide is is irrelevant when it comes to population. Uh, we have to examine the underlying reasons why we have a population explosion, uh, why third world countries are doubling uh, in their, their populations every 20 to 30 years. When we understand those reasons and we address those concerns, then we can get at uh, some of, then we can begin to solve the problems of the environment that are related to population growth. If we don't want to solve the underlying problems that cause population growth, then we're going to have it to continue. And let me give you some insight. Let, let's stop. For, the, uh, the Catholic Church obviously does not have anything to do with the population explosion in Egypt or Nepal. But the Catholic Church does have something to do with the population explosion on the west side of San Antonio, Texas. Mm -hmm. Indeed it does. And the Catholic and Church may be irrelevant to uh, worldwide population growth, but the Catholic Church is such a force for good in so many ways that if they change their policy on birth control, they could be a force for good in that regard. So I, don't, I wouldn't consider them irrelevant it, at all. It, it, well, the, the ways in which the uh, Catholic Church has been a force for good in third world countries have acted uh, to help bring down the population rate. Let me, let me explain How? to you. Explain. Let Please. me explain to you uh, the underlying mechanism at work. Right. And I'll tell you my own private uh, uh, story and how, how it how I came to uh, at least the beginning insight into this problem. I, live, I lived in India for a year, and I traveled through that country very widely. One uh, day uh, in a very, very uh, remote area in South India, I came across uh, a festival. The government had come in and declared a holiday, and they were having, there was a big marketplace people selling things, and the government had set up a stage, and there were actors and uh, actresses play with little skits, and uh, there were also some musicians. And upon inquiry, I found that the government had established uh, a vasectomy fair, a traveling vasectomy fair, <laughs> uh, in which they were yeah, encouraging uh, men, to Indian men, to have a vasectomy. And that's what the musicians and the, uh, and the uh, actors and actresses were, were, were there for. And they had erected uh, several tents, and uh, there was a tremendous incentive uh, among the population to have a vasectomy, uh, a, this incentive established by the Indian government. They would either receive $10 or a transistor radio. Now, in order to remove ourselves from ethnocentric uh, values, let me say that $10 is half a month's salary uh, in India, and so let's equate that to $1,000, and a transistor radio would be roughly the equivalent of a 100-watt Sony stereo system remote control CD. So uh, this was, this was a, a very helpful incentive by the Indian government to encourage these men to have a vasectomy. And I, I took a closer look. There were two lines of men, one line of men sort of ambling in, another line of men sort of in bow-legged fashion stumbling out. Uh, I looked at closely at the line of men who had been willing to have a vasectomy. And it became clear that there were serious problems because none, none of those men were in their 20s and 30s. Most oh. were in their 40s and 50s. Oh, wow. So we have to ask the question, why would not a young man 
get on that line? The answer is that it would be economic suicide for a young man to get on that line and have a vasectomy, just as it might be economic suicide for young people in the United States to have huge families of 10 people. It would be economic suicide for young men and women in this part of India to practice family planning. Why? This, was an, this is an area of subsistence agriculture a labor-intensive form of agriculture. Children are assets to that economic system. The more children you have, the wealthier the farmer can be. Let's talk about, let's, let's go, I think everybody understands that children are a source of wealth in an agricultural society, but I think that it behoove us to spend this time talking about the United States an urban industrialized country and what it's doing here. And what you were talking about, they're giving them $10 or a transistor radio, brings home a thought that I've, a recurring thought that I've had since this program was scheduled. And that is that if we reach a point where this government will get its head out of the sand and start discouraging births, the best way to do it that has been proven over and over and over again is through economic incentives. Discourage large families by taxing large families more, not less. That's, I've always felt that would be an excellent idea. It's That's ridiculous just, to pay people to have children at a is. time when the world is becoming too crowded. And I was, I was uh, at one of the high schools in the San Antonio Youth Literacy Program the other day which is a program that I work for. And I was talking to one of our leadership students who happened to be a girl student. And I was talking to her about uh, teen pregnancy in her school. And uh, I said, and I said to her, I said, Margaret, if you, if we paid girls not to have babies, do you think that they'd stop doing it? And she said, yeah, I do. <laughs> well, didn't they try a program like that in some other part of the country? It seems to me just recently I, I read that, that every month that these children, these girls, yeah, did not become they pregnant, they paid them something, and it was... Well, and of course, that I Have a Dream Foundation is, is sort of doing that. Now, what they're doing is they're not giving, they're not giving girls actual cash for not having babies, but they're luring at-risk students through school with the promise of mm -hmm. college at the end of it and with the promise of some sort of future mm -hmm. at the end of it. I think that what we face here in San Antonio and in a lot of poor cities is, is large uh, populations of teenagers who, for one reason or another, because a lot of them come out of dysfunctional families, have no self-esteem, and two, and then which, which exacerbates their natural disinclination to perceive the future. Right. Teenagers just don't have any idea of the future. I mean, very few of them do. Mm -hmm. And 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 so if they so if their if their self-esteem is low and their vision of the future is a future of just more of the same, in other words, nothing improving from the way that they look around and see life as it is, um, then naturally whether they have a baby or not is may be, when I say inconsequential, obviously it's going to be consequential, but it, it's not going to, it, they're not going to be sitting there having this intellectual thought of, you know, I should not have a baby because I cannot support it. That's not what they're thinking about. You know, they've got to get their head out of their pants, and that isn't going to happen because they're ignorant and because they're young. Mm -hmm. But if you gave them a carrot at the end of a stick and said, come on, hey, follow no. this, and then help them every step of the way, like we all help them, all the literacy providers help them, and all the human care services mm -hmm. help them, then we might, we might get them through to a successful conclusion of their education, at which point they could then support their babies that right. they wanted. Well, th what worries me is here, I think particularly, uh, we've had children having children now for several generations. Uh, I, I'm frightened. I read things in the paper about uh, a ministerial service was helping uh, poor families to have a happy Thanksgiving. 
uh, one woman, it said, a young mother of seven young children said that she had told the children they couldn't have Thanksgiving this year because she had to pay the utilities. Well, I can just see the picture right there. I mean, this, this is appalling. A young woman, she's probably been able to turn out five or six more in her, in her childbearing years. Uh, they should give her the pill and then the turkey. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm with you all the way. I'm not really, I'm not a Nazi about this. What I'm concerned about is a person who was trained in history and who is fairly widely read is that I am afraid that the natural conclusion of all these unwanted births or births or births of children who will not be raised to be highly functioning members of society because they're being raised by other children is that ultimately, right now, we're, our government is based, in spite of Ronald Reagan, on a liberal tradition of taking care of the helpless. And I am very, very liberal, and I have no problem with taking care of the helpless because most of the helpless are either very young or very old in this country. But I perceive the possibility of a day coming when the right will turn on the helpless, turn on the non-producers, and we will have a right-wing revolution in this country. Or the obverse of that is that the non-producers are procreating so fast that they could in turn overwhelm the producers in a left-wing revolution and we don't want either one of those no that's that is we want terrifying. a moderate secular centrist government mm -hmm. and it may not be in our lifetimes but it is a very very real possibility I, I think so too what I'm wondering it seems to me the incentive idea is such a good one I, I'm like you I'm not a Nazi and I'm not trying to deprive people of rights but there comes a time when, uh, as you say, this, this uh, unbalance is going to occur, uh, you would think that women who are on drugs wouldn't want to be pregnant time after time after time. Surely they wouldn't. Couldn't we offer them uh, sterilization or... Because we're, we're reaping uh, drug babies, a time bomb. We've got this terrible problem. That it goes on and on and on. There's no end to it. It's, uh, somebody's got to step in with something fairly... Uh, Secure, you know, a real definite plan that will appeal to these people who are the children having children having children. Uh, let me uh, uh, fill you in on some dynamics that are taking place in the third world that may help you to unravel the problem here at home. Uh, all the birth control in the world brought to third world countries will not be used, will not solve their population problem. Uh, even in the cities, uh, families are, ha will have as many children as possible because of the economic situation is favorable. It is poverty in the third world that breeds overpopulation. Mm -hmm. Because the people are very poor, they basically need uh, it behooves them to have as many children as possible. Uh, there are other reasons, such as high infant mortality rates. Uh, but the underlying key to the high population in third world countries is poverty. And so by advocating programs such as birth control and st sterilization and abortions without addressing the underlying concerns of poverty is to advocate a program that is designed to fail. But it seems I totally to me it's a agree. circle. I totally agree. But the thing is that we We've go back to, to economic in. incentives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And China came close for a while to breaking the population growth cycle by taxing families who had more than two children. Now, I'm not, I think that that's sort of coming unraveled from what I read, but economic incentives work, and that, which is the same thing as saying is, is, is 
so it's, it's not the same thing as solving poverty, clearly, but it's in the same vein. Countries that have made uh, strides in population control are countries that have managed fair and equitable development for, its, for their people. And those programs are the programs that eventually work to slow down the rate of population control. Such as, and would they work here? Can, can you give me some? Uh, in third world countries, uh, in third world countries, programs are such as uh, school for both boys and girls, compulsory education, child labor laws, uh, industrialization in general, uh, urbanization uh, is, is, is very helpful. Any economic development that pertains to women and, uh, and any economic development that pertains to women is extremely helpful in, in eventually uh, bringing down the, uh, birth, the birth rate. So uh, the key to understanding population probably worldwide lies in programs of education, not education relating to birth control, but education relating to bettering people's way of life. Right. Then pop birth control, population control, the number of children take care of themselves. It's kind of a chicken egg situation exactly. here, isn't it? I just the I cycle of poverty, I believe it's called. Uh, yes, I think so. The poor with will and be with you By the time we get all that managed in the continent of Africa, for instance, we won't have any elephants left mm -hmm. or the great cats. It's just terrifying. It really is. Well, I, I really almost feel we're doomed, and I, the only cheerful thing, I have I've been told that after we kill ourselves off, the planet will regenerate itself, but it's not going to happen in the six days it happened the first time around. It will be a long, 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 long time, and the precious little comfort that is. So we have talked and talked and solved absolutely, absolutely nothing. nothing. <laughs> we are right back where we started from. No, I, can, we do a, can we do another program sometime? <laughs> it would be my pleasure. I, I feel that uh, we, we definitely, something has to take place. Stephen Mumford is very outspoken about certain steps. I mean, you have to start somewhere. And even if you say this might not be the real uh, step that's going to solve everything, if you would just chip away at a little bit here and a little bit there until eventually you can manage this. It's so vast, we've let it go on far, far, far too long, I think. And I, I really have to, uh, to agree with uh, Dr. Mumford in his assessment of, uh, of the church. I'm afraid it's, uh, after all, look, uh, the Pope goes to South America and he doesn't say anything about let's control our poor, uh, 8,000, what did they have, a terrible program yes, the other? But, but he talks about poverty and bettering uh, the average person's life, the dignity of work, uh, social, as long as he discusses social justice and those, those kind of issues in the long run, as I said, all the birth control is meaningless without the un fundamental changes of bettering people's way of life. Well, of course, talk is cheap, and that's what he does a lot of. Well, we'll have to wrap this up for now, and I do hope you'll both come back again, and we can do some more of this. It's Thank been you. a lot of fun. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have. Thank you very much. That's all for Free Thought Forum now. See you next week. I think as I please, and this gives me pleasure. My conscience decrees, this right I must treasure. My thoughts will not cater to Duke or dictator. No person.